in a world where overspending, debt, and keeping up with the Joneses rules us all. Where the voices from the merchants, restaurants, and credit companies lord over the common man. Out of the darkness, like a beacon of hope, comes a new voice. A voice that's rich and creamy, like your favorite butter, and delicious, like cheeseburger pizza on your diet cheat day. It's The Stacking Benjamin Show. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and you might be broke, but did you ever think that your bank is broke too? Today, to share stories from the dirty secret world of money laundering, we welcome the author of Invisible Trillions, Raymond Baker. In our headlines, one 32-year-old man makes $39,000 per month working just 30 minutes a day. Can you replicate that? We'll share details. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Kevin, who has a question about tipping his cap on his funds. And then I'll share some bad trivia. And now, two guys who help you navigate the system no matter how jacked up it is. It's Joe and O J J J J G. Hey, stackers. Welcome to the Stacky Benjamin Show. You made it. You found us. Sit back and relax because we're about to have an hour of financial fun. I am Joe Saul. See hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And uh, Doug, you do the sheep noise incredibly well. Good job. I've been practicing. It's good. It it's is. just one of my many talents. The guy across the card table from me who is a wolf in sheep's clothing. I don't know. Mr. OG's here. How are you, man? I'm not, I'm not a wolf in sheep's clothing. I'm a sheep dog. There's a difference. He is. Very nice to the sheep. I'm very mad at wolves. Man, OG, oh not often do we do this. We are going to dive into the dirty underbelly of, of how money travels in secret. You've heard about these dummy corporations, people moving money to the Caymans, companies that are laundering cash, just all this stuff. Raymond Baker is a guy who his entire career has been involved in this industry and exposing it, shining a flashlight. And today we're going to take you on a little ride through the side of money that most of us don't experience, hope we never will, and don't want to end up in an orange jumpsuit. <laughs> Probably don't want it. Uh, but Raymond Baker, who worked with the Brookings Institute on this, Harvard Business School, done a lot of great work and today we're going to dive in with him raymond baker upstairs talking to mom but first could you make thirty nine thousand dollars a month as a side hustle heck yeah sounds good to me not a bad let's, deal uh, i can do it let's let's dive in hello darlings and now it's time for your favorite part of the show our stacking benjamin's headlines today's piece comes to us from the cnbc makeup blog this is written by megan sawyer 32-year-old brings in $39,000 a month renting his two boats to strangers, and he only works 30 minutes a day. Let's do this. I like a good case study, so I want to uh, dive into this case, OG, a little bit. Uh, let me read the top of this. J.P. Mancini II has always been attracted to luxury. He just assumed the barrier of entry was too high. Then last January, he decided to rent out his $400,000 boat. Upon oh. listing the 37-foot boat docked in Key West, Florida, on a rental platform called Boat Setter, he booked 11 trips in a month. The next month, that number doubled. Sensing opportunity, the 32-year-old sales professional began listing his boat on other rental platforms like Get My Boat and bought a second smaller boat for rentals in Hampton, Virginia, where he lives. Today, Mancini's two boats bring in an average of $38,800 in revenue per month, according to documents reviewed by CNBC Make It. That's off only 30 minutes of work per day spent managing bookings and making sure the boat's captains who were hired and paid by individual renters are maintaining his watercraft properly, Mancini says. Over the past year, Mancini says he took home $190,000 after expenses from his boats, about $100,000 shy of what he made at the peak of his full-time sales career, but with far fewer hours worked. Instead of using the money to pay down the $550,000 in loans he took out to buy the boats, 
Mancini says he plans to funnel it toward more watercraft purchases and other real estate opportunities. We're going to dive into his situation, but oh gee, let's, let's be clear about this. What's the chance you think he really only works 30 minutes a day on this? Uh, pretty low, pretty low chance. Uh, it's like the Tim Ferriss four hour work week. That's really 44 hour work week. But, um, I mean, it's probably some low number, right? But sure. 30 minutes, that seems a little suspect. Yeah. Whenever I read these headlines, I just think we sell the sexiness. And of course, yeah. you know, if somebody had asked me, hey, you make $39,000 a uh, month on this, how much time? Oh, I spend four minutes. It's super easy. You can do it yeah. too. I mean, I just went out and bought a $400,000 boat. Just because I read this article, I was like, sweet. Must be pretty easy if this dude can do it. Everybody knows boats are an easy way to make money. Easy. That whole I mean, phrase just... that, you know, they're just a hole in the water into which you pour money. That's a misnomer. Yeah. Well, the thing that I've always heard is people say the best day of a boater's life is the day that you buy it and the day that you make 38000 every day on renting it. That's so the... <laughs> I was like, I'm in. I'm going to buy five of them. We don't have as much water here, which... A little bit of a downside for us, but um, I'll take thirty thousand a day. That's okay, or a month. What is it? How much is he making? Thirty thousand a month. month. Thirty nine thousand a month. Oh, yeah, right. thirty eight thousand eight hundred. As great as I thought, but okay. You know, the first question I had when I read this piece was: He's thirty two years old and owns a four hundred thousand dollar boat. Nice. We might have some some people at thirty two years old, thirty five years old, forty years old listening, going, "How, how does that happen?" Well, we got to dive into his story because like anything, this thing that looks like, hey, you just click your heels together and you make $39,000 a month might not be as easy as you think it is. In fact, there's a great quote by Michelangelo. I'm going to get this a little wrong, but he basically says, if you knew what I went through to be as good at this as I am, it would make you really depressed. Like you, you would not want anything to do with becoming the master of my craft. And while that might not be the case here, Obviously, how he got there is every bit as important as to where he is. So first of all, he began OG in the U.S. Air Force, and he was in the Air Force until 25. Let's talk about that, because I think that getting some of these skills, some of the training that you will find in the armed forces, that you will find in some of these jobs can set you up on a great path to a fantastic career. Number one, if you know how to take that and leverage some of these things, I think the fact that he was in the Air Force is something we should talk about first. Well, especially if you're in your career path, you know, uh, logistics or uh, supply chain management, uh, accounting, you know, obviously, you know, if you're in the military and your focus is machine gunning, it's different skill set, but, but even that's transferable from a tenacity standpoint and planning orientation. And, you know, there's lots of other intangible characteristics of infantry folks too, but, um, what a great learning opportunity or great learning, learning area where you're surrounded by people that are your peers, literally, and entrusted with lots of responsibility early on. So I'm obviously a big advocate for the military. Yeah, a lot of lessons, I think, to be learned by decentralized leadership about having to make do with limited resources, you know, do what you can with what you have, make it the best that you possibly can. Right now, we've got the enemies right in front of us. We can't wait for other stuff. We got to get this moving. Like some of that training is amazing. And yet, you know, a lot of people don't think about that training when they're first starting out. They don't think about what is my training progression to get to this point. Second piece here is <laughs> to be fair, when you're just starting out of the military, you're really focused on how do I not die right this minute <laughs> in boot camp? <laughs> like, how do I not piss off my drill sergeant? <laughs> there's really not a lot of like, this is advancing my career. I can't wait to be relied upon in the, you know, in four years from now. I'm not even thinking about that as much as I'm thinking, oh, you know what? I would like to, you know, and this has become the very popular beat down. But I want this degree from a four-year institution that's going to do nothing for me. I'm not going to think of it all as, as, as training. And don't get me wrong. I had a liberal arts education. I think it can be very important. I think it can create good communication skills and give you a wide base to work from. But there's a lot of people, OG, at age 18 that aren't thinking, you know what? I'm building skills. Almost all of them, I would say. I'm just thinking, 
this is just kind of what I want to do. Yeah. If you can focus that and get to 25 and you're out of the military, I think you've gained, you've gained a lot if you can process that. So uh, from there, he went into car sales in native Virginia. Again, I don't think of car sales as being the path to riches for a lot of people. It can be, but I don't think that's the path that they put on the resume, right? Go to four-year college, get into a good college and a good curriculum. He's doing this a whole different way. But think about what you learn when you're selling. He climbed from the ranks of salesperson to general sales manager in a year and a half. This is a guy, OG, that proved very quickly that he understood the art of selling which frankly is a lot of the art of communication and of being able to not just fight objections and be sales in the slimiest sense, but sales mm -hmm. in the, we all have to sell ourselves. This is a guy that early on learned how to sell himself very well. Problem solver, right? He solved problems. That's really what selling is, is just providing a solution. Yeah. Think about the negotiations on cars uh, selling whatever service or product you offer, I think that that's, that's invaluable. So he not only does these things, but he succeeds at them, earns some money, worked this career into a spot where he's making $290,000 a year. Not taking the traditional path, OG. Not right. taking the traditional path, making $290,000 a year. Getting these skills together. And then he uses it to buy a $400,000 boat. And he doesn't do it. Now let's talk about this, this, this purchase. He's got $550,000 in loans on boats, OG. Sure hope his financial plan doesn't sink. Oh, wait. There it is. I sure hope he can keep those payments afloat. <laughs> can he float the loan? I think uh, if he lost his job. He'd be rowing upstream without a paddle. Okay. Next Joe, next segment, please yeah, get please, us to the next segment. Please, please. Yes. At some point, OG, then he becomes a business owner. He takes those skills. He becomes a business owner and he has to take a risk. We talked to Amy Porterfield on Monday. At some point you got to jump off and you got to go, you know what? I'm going to become a business owner. I'm going to, I'm going to have to set up this thing. And definitely if you're signing on $550,000 in boat loans, that's not without significant risk. Yeah. I mean, it could be some stormy seas ahead. Okay. I think we, I think we did, we did uh, that one in. I think there's quite a case study there on, um, the headline versus the reality. Yeah. This is somebody that did a lot of things that the average person has not done, has succeeded at those things and was able to catapult it to be able to work maybe 30 minutes a day, maybe longer, but with significant uh, debt and also having built a business model ahead of time. You just don't click your heels together and all of a sudden you're on the front page of cnbc.com. Yeah. And my guess is, is that, the 30 minutes is on this, right? Or the hour is on this. And then he spends another hour on another project and another hour on his, you know, you know what I mean? Like, it's not that he's yeah. sitting around. Like, people who are successful don't often rest. It's kind of the next thing. And, he sa and it says that in the, in the article, doesn't it? Like, he's planning it on does. using some of the profits to help, it, you know, add some rental properties to the mix. Doing the next thing. And I think it goes back to Michelangelo's quote that I paraphrased earlier. When you see like what he went through to get to this point and what's really going on, it's a little bit different story, but still congratulations. 39,000 bucks capitalizing on, on that designing a curriculum. I'll take it. Absolutely. Coming up next, Raymond Baker's a graduate of Harvard business school and Georgia Institute of technology. He received the MacArthur foundation grant to support in-depth research on illicit financial flows as a guest scholar at the Brookings Institute that culminated in his first book, which made a huge splash, Capitalism's Achilles Heel, Dirty Money and How to Renew the Free Market System. Financial Times called it one of the best business books of 2005. Today he's back. He has a new book called Invisible Trillions, and he's going to dive into, OG, oh, this dirty underworld, this dirty, dirty underworld of, of uh, how money goes from one hand to another doesn't get taxed, doesn't get reported, and ends up making boat leases, probably. But probably, probably put it put it on a boat, 
out of Key West. Yes. Raymond Baker up next, but uh, Doug, I think you got some trivia for us first. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And on this day in 1997, a sheep was cloned for the first time. And that was like 30 years ago. Come on, science. I thought for sure by now I'd have my own clone. Somebody's got to clean up all these peanut shells. Well, my clone would definitely be named like a, a Mr. Stallion or maybe Buster Studley. Today's question is this. What was that sheep's name? I'll be back right after I order some more rouge. Don't judge me. It takes a lot of money to look this cheap. Hey there, stackers. I'm working woe man and Grand Tetons enthusiast, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. The sheep in question, which incidentally is how Joe's defense attorney began his opening remarks, was cloned in Edinburgh, Scotland from mammary gland cells of a six-year-old Finn Dorset sheep. And because the sheep's DNA came from a mammary gland cell, they named it after noted lactation activist, Dolly Parton. And now we'll bounce it over to Raymond Baker. I'm so happy we have him here with us. Raymond Baker joins us. How are you, man? I'm doing great, and thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Man, the, the hours you spent, the years you spent on research for this book, just reading it, it must have been it, it was clearly a labor of love. But tell me about the inspiration. Where did this mission start for you, Raymond? Well, I hate to go back all the way to the 1960s, so let me start in 2005 instead with the publication of my first book, Capitalism's Achilles' Heel. After that was published, we set up global financial integrity and additional organizations were created. And we were all working on problems uh, surrounding illicit financial flows. And I didn't think we were making enough progress. So I decided um, in 2015 to write another book. The outgrowth of, of uh, that is Invisible Trillions, with the hope that we can, through this effort and uh, additional efforts, drive the understanding that capitalism is operating at a level of secrecy that is threatening to itself, capitalism, as well as threatening to democracy. The first words of your introduction, I think, drive that point home. You begin this entire work by saying, we are at an inflection point. What a place to start. Tell us about the inflection point. Where are we right now? We have to come to an understanding of the threat that the democratic capitalist system is under, and we have not come to uh, that threat. Uh, Joe, let me refer briefly to the, um, the climate change issue. Scholars and academics knew in the 1970s and 80s and 90s uh, that global warming was a reality, but that didn't get into the global consciousness. So now we broadly, uh, we understand that climate change is a huge issue. That's where we are in this issue that I'm talking about. That's where we are in reappraising the relationship between capitalism and democracy. We need to get this into the global consciousness. And let me be very clear, Joe. I regard the democratic capitalist system as the best invention in political economy uh, yet devised. But it is being damaged. It is being hurt by invisible, secret, under-the-table dealings that have become normalized in capitalism. Well, I'm glad you started there, Raymond, because obviously we do a lot of research before we have somebody on the show. And I find your work incredibly fascinating, but I also find some of the backlash that I read from people, frankly, sometimes that I think that haven't actually read your stuff that you are anti-capitalist. But the more I read Invisible Trillions, the more I see this, you're fighting a war for capitalism, for openness, for this ability for companies and us all to be able to compete on a capitalist playing field. You're absolutely right. I went to Harvard Business School. I've been CEO of seven companies in my career. I've done business all over the world. I know that you can do business 
honestly and accountably and transparently, and it's better when you do business that way. When I graduated from Harvard Business School in 1960, that was the end of a 15-year period post-World War II when, in my opinion, the capitalist system in America operated at the highest level of responsibility that it had ever uh, operated at. The ratio of executive pay to workers' wages, for example, at the end of that period, at the end of the post-war period, 1960, was 20 to 1. You know what the ratio is now? More than 350 to 1. Yeah. Disparity has characterized the way that capitalism is operating. Inequality is the effect of the way that capitalism is operating today. Ultimately, inequality will defeat the free market system, will defeat the the democratic capitalist system unless we get it uh, controlled and begin to reverse it. I want to dive into that in just a second, but I also want to clarify one more thing. You know, a lot of people, most of our stacker community, Raymond, they're all about privacy. I'm all about privacy. You drive a hard wedge between privacy and secrecy. Can you define the difference for us here? Because I think this is critical to where we're going to go next. Absolutely. I'm all for privacy. I want my bank account to remain private. I don't want people looking at my bank account. However, that's not the same as it being secret. If, for example, uh, somebody is accused of a terrorist act with a name similar to mine and government officials need to check uh, um, all possible accounts, go for it. I don't care. My privacy is not above your security, Joe. So, yes, let's, let's continue to have private dealings, but totally secret? That doesn't work in, in the democratic capitalist system. You went back to 2005 earlier, but I do want to go back further than that. Let's talk about kind of the rise of secrecy in the system, like how this all began, Raymond. When did secrecy really become one of these core things that we have to fight if we're fighting for democracy? It really began to take off in the 1960s. I'm certainly not suggesting that secrecy was invented in the 1960s, sure. but it began to take on global proportions in the 1960s. There were two things that drove that. One, 48 countries gained their independence um, uh, in the 1960s, and a lot of people wanted to take their money out And so we created a financial secrecy system that would support that movement. Second thing that happened in the 1960s was multinational corporations began to spread uh, all over the globe. There were very few multinational corporations before 1960. By the end of the 60s, they were all uh, all over the place. And they, too, wanted ways to be able to take revenues and profits out of those risky investments, particularly in developing countries. And so they created secret mechanisms for getting money out. Basically, what they did was to utilize the misinvoicing of trade, trade conducted in such a way as to move the profits with, within the trade transaction rather than going through the messy process of accumulating uh, retained earnings and declaring dividends and remitting uh, dividends and so on. You don't need to do any of that. Just put the excess price in the invoices that you're charging and get the money out uh, through misinvoicing of trade. But it was those two things in the 1960s that accelerated the movement uh, to secret. Independence for a lot of countries, movement of multinational corporations around the globe. I want to ask you about misinvoicing because I found this fascinating as I was reading Invisible Trillions. It sounds like what you're really saying is that this is fairly easy because the devil's going to be in a spreadsheet somewhere. Like if I'm an auditor, Raymond, and I have to read through every invoice, it seems fairly easy for somebody to take one line item of a thousand, you know, of a thousand lines and just make a little switch so that it makes it very easy for me to transfer maybe millions of dollars sometimes. It's easy to do, and I'll just touch upon your point about the auditors. The auditors are under no obligation to point this out. 
Joe, when I arrived in Nigeria in 1961, one of the early people that I talked to was the managing director of a trading company. The company was a subsidiary of a UK-based uh, parent organization. And I asked this guy, how do you do business uh, in Nigeria, in Africa? And after some conversation, he said to me, this is not difficult. I'm not trying to make a profit. What? Now, I had just what? finished Harvard Business School, <laughs> and here's one of the first people I meet, and he says, I'm not, I had no idea you're what thinking, he was talking about. You're thinking he might be bad at this. That's what you're thinking. Yeah. So it took me a while to understand the whole matter of transfer pricing. Pricing in such a way that you're transferring your profit margin overseas within the invoice of what you're buying from overseas. It's simple. It's done all the time. I have never known, I've, I've looked at this phenomenon now for 60 years, I have never known a multinational, multi-product, multi-billion dollar corporation that did not use trade misinvoicing, falsified trade, to move money across borders in ways that are just plain uh, invisible. You can't see it. So tell me if I'm wrong here to kind of clarify what you're saying, because this can be, I think what you're alluding to, this could be completely legal. I take an item that is in subsidiary A of a company. I sell it to subsidiary B of a company way underpriced so that when I move it to the subsidiary that's in a different country, I maybe get more favorable tax treatment now. And now I can realize the gain in subsidiary B with a better tax structure than I can in subsidiary A. Completely legal, completely fine on paper, but completely secret and really transferring billions of dollars? You've described it perfectly accurately. Wow. The, the, the question of its legality is complicated. It is illegal in a lot of countries to misinvoice trade for the purpose of moving uh, money across borders. But those laws are difficult to enforce. They're not enforced. And so the practice is done all the time. Now, very interestingly, there have been three cases decided in the United States um, uh, in the last uh, seven years that suggest that this breaks U.S. law. The deliberate misinvoicing of trade which is done for the purpose of denying another country of its customs duties or tax revenues or what have you, um, uh, according to those case decisions, uh, is illegal. This hasn't yet sunk satisfactorily into the thinking of uh, uh, corporate leaders. And so what I do in my book is I say, if you want to claim that this is legal, then give a one-sentence letter to your employees that says that when you indulge in these activities, the chance that you may be committing an, a felony offense is zero. If you think this is legal, give that letter to your employees. They're in a multinational that'll give that letter to their employees. They just won't do it. What does that mean? That means we've got an awful lot of people working in multinational corporations that very well maybe probably are committing offenses, but they're not being charged for it. You go through many of the devices that people use to move money secretly, uh, dummy corporations, you've got fake trust, you've got all kinds of different ways people, people move money, tax havens. When you were doing the research for Invisible Trillions, which ones were most fascinating to you? There were the way people will secretly move money from hand A to hand B. I segued into the Brookings Institution in 1997, and I did a research project. I traveled to 23 countries and conducted 335 interviews. Joe, there are three components of illicit money that flow across borders. The corrupt component, the criminal component, and the commercial component. Corrupt, criminal, and commercial. I thought at that time that the corrupt component uh, was the biggest. That is theft by government officials, taking money out of their treasuries and sending it abroad. I thought that was the biggest component. After I had gone to 23 countries and conducted 335 interviews, 
I realize that the corrupt component, I'm talking about cross-border transfers now, the corrupt component was the smallest, the criminal was next, and the commercial component was by far the biggest uh, Really? The leg legitimate businesses? Absolutely. And it's because you can so easily use falsified trade to do anything you want to uh, with your money, shifting it back and forth, evading taxes, converting it from soft currencies to hard currencies. You can do anything you want to. The commercial component is by far the biggest part of this problem. Speaking of commercial entities and multinational corporations, where do banks sit in the whole secrecy game? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> when banks see what looks like dirty money, uh, money that looks like it has been corrupt or criminal, it's from drug traders or what have you, uh, they are supposed to file a report. Let's talk about U.S. banks. They're supposed to file a report with the U.S. Uh, Financial Intelligence Agency, which is called FinCEN. Do you know how many reports are filed? I know it's got to be a lot because because what I remember, Raymond, I used to work for American Express, and I remember all the training that we got and all of the, hey, if you see this, you see this, you see this. I mean, the anti-money laundering stuff that we got there was like, so I would guess that there's a ton of reports filed. A, an average of 80,000 a day. A day. What this means is that U.S. banks will find a reason to take every, just about every dollar of dirty money that they can, uh, just so they file a suspicious activities report um, with the um, uh, Financial Intelligence Agency. 80,000 such reports filed uh, every day. U.S. banks will find a reason to take the money and file the report. Anti-money laundering efforts within banks are a failed exercise. Well, it is funny uh, you you point this out when you say 80,000. I hate to admit to everybody that I knew how you were going to answer that question from reading your book, but I did. But you point out, so the average person listening, probably uh, Raymond's thinking what I'm thinking, 80,000 reports. Hey, that means the system's working. You're like, no, 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 no. This is actually proving that the system is failing. Uh, some people argue that the, that shows that the system is working. It would be working if FinCEN, the Financial Intelligence Agency, had the capacity to deal with 80,000 reports a day. But they don't have anything close to that capacity. So 79,990 of them go unread, unreferred to uh, by FinCEN, and the bank gets to, uh, to handle the transaction. Take the deposit and handle the transaction. It seems in some ways that banks are not just complicit, but in some ways governments are, uh, Raymond. You write this. Citigroup, after the 2007-2008 debacle in the bailout, they received $45 billion as a bailout, but then they reduced its consumer banking business by a third. They laid off 40% of its staff. They closed 62% of its branches in middle America. Citigroup didn't eat the loss we all lost it. We lost the ability to bank like we could before 2007, 2008. We ate it. Absolutely correct. The Fed and the Treasury made the decision that we got to save the banking system. That's number one. They did not decide to, uh, that we have to save the consumer. That's number two. But no, it's the banking system that has to be prioritized, and therefore we poured tens of billions uh, into the financial system and the banks recorded record profits, uh, uh, laid off staff, um, easily survived the, uh, the financial crisis. And it took middle class of America 10 years to get back to where they were in 2007. They didn't recover from their losses until 2017 or 18. All this money, the fines that banks pay, the uh, the people that they hire to, you know, fight with the government over fines. D did I read this right? Th this is all tax deductible? Absolutely. The fine you pay is tax deductible. The, so, uh, the fees so you bad. pay uh, to your lawyers are tax deductible. Um, handling dirty money is a, is a money-making enterprise. And, <laughs> and as long as that's true, Joe, then we are literally 
risking the capitalist system. This can't continue at the level at which it is now. I estimate that, uh, that roughly half of global financial operations, global uh, commercial operations, pass through the financial secrecy system at one point, from uh, origination to completion. Um, probably half of global economic affairs pass through the financial secrecy system at some point. I want to ask you another banking question, but, but I kind of want to use that to end our time together. So before we get to that, I want to bounce briefly over to crypto because Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan Chase has kind of, he doesn't even call it a currency. He's like, yeah, this is, this is garbage. Obviously when you, when you, when you look at Warren Buffett um, and talks about cryptocurrency and says, this is, this is not a great thing. What role does crypto play when it comes to a lot of this secrecy that you're outlining so effectively, I think, in your book? Let's draw a difference between cryptocurrency and other kinds of digital currency. I'm not opposed to central bank establishing a digital currency. I think a cryptocurrency, which functions in secret, is a huge risk for the people that buy it. The only asset value of a cryptocurrency is the possibility that someone else is going to talk it up to a higher uh, value uh, in the future. We're now looking at Samuel Bankman Fried and uh, his colleagues and so forth. In my opinion, that will at the end of the day be adjudged as a fraud. Um, a continuation of uh, the kinds of frauds that have uh, affected us for years. Uh, Enron, um, uh, Madoff, uh, others. We've now got two or three of his lieutenants pleading guilty. I have no idea how he's going to plead innocent um, uh, and come out of it. Well, and this is just the latest, right? I mean, the huge number of fraud cases we've had in the NFT markets, the number, you know, the SEC finally going after people. It just, there's so much opportunity here for fraud and for secrecy and just a few people getting rich at the, at the, at sadly, at, um, at the risk of all of us. I mean, I think people thought this was going to be the lottery and it turned out to be the lottery. It feels like for a few people who, who, who now may be going to jail, but up until then looked, looked, I don't know, pretty good for them. Last time I looked at, there were something like 10,000 uh, cryptocurrencies. A handful of them get the bulk of uh, the publicity. But cryptocurrencies, they're on a continuum. Some of them are totally invisible. Others of them actually fall under securities and exchange control regulations. But I don't see the wisdom of investing in an asset whose only value is uh, somebody talking about how it's going to soar uh, in value, and therefore it does, and you buy it, um, I think. No, to me, it makes no sense. Digital currencies make a lot of sense. Crypto, to me, there's no there there. Yeah, but well, let's get back into banking then, but where the central banking system, not in the United States, but just around the world. You dive into one of our favorite topics, Raymond, Wells Fargo. Nothing I like uh, better than uh, than than talking smack about Wells Fargo after all they did to us. You dive into this, but you write this, not just about Wells Fargo, but about banks in general. You write, quote, banks should not be in the business of selling money. Their business should be about empowerment and progress for depositors and borrowers conducted within a culture that builds trust and confidence steeped in the highest ethics. How do we get back to that? How do we get back there? Where do we go from here, Raymond? My father was an entrepreneur in Shreveport, Louisiana for 30 years. And he had a reputation of being a completely honest and straightforward individual. The biggest bank in town came to him um, in his 50s and offered him the presidency of the bank. My father was the most honest individual I've ever known. I never saw my father try to maximize his profits on a transaction. He always wanted to come to a fair price in his transaction. Fair to him, fair to the other person. Everybody in the community trusted him. Everybody wanted to do business with him. It, making him the president of the bank was a great thing. That kind of ethic that I grew up admiring my father for, that kind of ethic is hard to find uh, these days. How many people do you know 
that don't want to maximize their profits. They want to arrive at a fair profit on their trip. How many do you know like that? And I'm not suggesting that the answer to this is for us to all study uh, uh, morality more deeply. No. The answer to what I'm talking about is increased transparency and accountability in transactions. And I go all the way back to my father, who was as transparent and accountable, more so than anyone I've ever known. Well, I think this is a definite first step there, just shining a light on all of these ways that people are operating without us knowing. And the number of, um, I don't know, the number of cases that you point out that are right in front of us, Raymond, right in front of us that we see as time goes by just shows us that it's happening right underneath our noses. The book is called Invisible Trillions, How Financial Secrecies Imperiling Capitalism and Democracy and the Way to Renew Our Broken System. And I think it's available everywhere, correct? Yes. Raymond, thank you so much for this important work and for shining a light on the secrecy in our financial system. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Hey, this is Joe Crane, host of Veteran on the Move podcast. And when I'm not helping veterans transition to entrepreneurship, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Raymond Baker. As we mentioned, OG, uh, as Raymond said, not a lot really that we can do with that. But knowing knowing that there's, <laughs> that there's it's not just dummy corporations and money in the Caymans, but it's sometimes right under our nose. The fact that Wells Fargo is involved uh, to some degree makes me feel good because nothing we like better than busting on Wells Fargo. Nice. No? Too soon? Is it too soon? No. I don't, no. I, I don't know. Not too soon. Hey, let's throw out Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, OG, they put what you value first. I'm still elbow deep in um, oh boy. Girl Scout cookies. Just had a sleeve for lunch. Serving size, as I like to call it, That's when I put it in my fitness pal, it's like, how many did you have? I'm like, I had one serving size. One serving, <laughs> just one little serving. 1,100 calories of thin mints later. <laughs> I'm sure that when you did your life insurance physical, it was probably right after, and you just told them, oh, I just had one serving of cookies. That's all I had. This is a fasting blood test, right? <laughs> oh, great right. thing about great thing about Haven though, <laughs> don't need blood tests. That's right. We're going to need a stool sample. Why does this stool smell like mint? <laughs> and speaking of speaking of uh, fasting, I ate those really fast, yes. like super fast. Way fast. That's why Haven Life actually has made things so simple. They've streamlined the application. They've gotten rid of all those questions that, frankly, they don't need to ask. It's simple. It's online. You get instant coverage decision, affordable prices, and all policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual which is more than a 160-year-old insurer. So you know they've been there before and they know what they're doing. Stackingbenjamins.com slash Haven Life. Get your life insurance done, people. Let's get it done. Today, you know what we're going to get done? We're going to get done throwing the lifeline out to Kevin. Say hi, Kevin. Hey, Joe, OG, and Doug. I've got a question for you all. I've been listening to the show since my freshman year of college. Now that I'm making some real money at 24, I want to know the best way to start building a retirement portfolio. I'm currently saving as aggressively as I can into my employer's Roth 401k. I invest equally into small cap, mid cap, large cap growth, and large cap value funds. Am I leaving potential gains on the table by doing so? Should I be pouring this tax advantage money into potentially higher returning assets like small and mid cap funds while they have the most time to grow? Or should I continue to evenly divide my capital across multiple equity styles to smooth out my ride? How best can I leverage my most valuable asset, time, and my Roth 401k? Thanks for your help, and I can't wait for the new podcast to drop, hopefully on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so I can hear Doug's sweet, sweet voice five days a week. <laughs> my man! <laughs> How about that? Kevin, thank you so much. For people wondering what he's talking about, the new Stacking Deeds podcast debuts uh, March 7th with Alan Corey and Crystal Hammond and Mom's Neighbor Doug. And uh, we're looking forward to that. It will be on Tuesdays, by the way. It's once a week on Tuesdays. And the first couple episodes you will hear here in the feed. So if you want to sample it, you won't have to go very far. But, OG, I think he's asking the right question. By the way, congratulations, Kevin. Asking yeah. these questions and being aggressive at an early age is going to pay us so many dividends later. So good for you on what sounds like a lot of good stuff early on. But, OG, what do you think? Should he be more aggressive than he is now? No, the only thing that came to mind when listening to 
the places where his money is going was there's not a lot of diversification benefits between small companies and mid-sized companies. They're very similar in terms of, you know, they're kind of ups and downs. So there's um, not a ton of value in having that, that split out. <clears throat> really the biggest thing that you can work on from, you know, let's say 24 to 34 is dumping as much money in as you possibly can. Like figuring out a way to squeeze every little bit of extra money that you can possibly gather into your investment portfolio, because there's going to come a time, you know, you think about kind of this, you know, your, your working career, your lifespan of working, you know, right now it's like, I just got out of college. I'm used to eating ramen noodles. And now these idiots are paying me 80 grand a year. Like I got all sorts of money. It's like crazy. I can save tons, but that changes to now I've, married and I've got three kids and I have a mortgage and two car payments and my kid needs special braces and this other kid's in private school and I'm saving money for like, there's going to be other stuff going on. And then they're, you know, and then they're gone and then you can, you make more money. You know what I mean? Like there's kind of this ebb and flow that happens and realizing in your late thirties, as so many people do like, Oh crap, I should have saved more money when I was in my twenties and thirties. Cause now I'm hitting this high cost of living time where I'm traveling more, I'm just, you know, whatever is like eating up more money. It's going to hard be hard to kind of jerk the wheel in that direction at that time. So the asset allocation matters a little bit, but not a ton until you have boatloads of cash in there. And just having it all invested in stock is, is good. Um, you might have some international there. I didn't see, I didn't hear international in this. There was no international. Things. That's what I was thinking too. So there's probably some opportunity there, but all stock, that's great. Maybe some international, that might be better. But the biggest thing is if you're saving five thousand dollars a year, try to save fifty five hundred. If you're saving Where twenty thousand, try to save twenty five thousand. So if he said he's allocating equally between I think large, mid and, and small, where mm-hmm. should he borrow from when I say borrow, but like which one should he reduce of those three to add into yeah. international? I can help with that one because he's actually dug fifty percent large because he's got large company growth and large company value. And midsize and small. So when he said he's each one of those is a quarter. So I would borrow from that large company, and also, well, maybe even the mid OG because of the fact that he, you know, like you said, not a lot of diversification between large and mid. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're just looking across the globe from a GDP standpoint, you would have about fifty five ish percent of your money in the United States and forty five percent outside of the United States. That's pretty aggressive weighting from a U.S. to non-U.S. mix. Most people I'd say are is like 75, 25 U.S., 70, 30 U.S. And then you can do those same diversifiers inside of those, those sections, big and small, like you're doing, you know, whatever suits your knees or floats your boat, floats your boat. Get it? You, you know, <laughs> but back to the boat again. We're back on the boat already. Yep. Back there, just staying focused. Hey, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with, I certainly don't want him to do what the guy did on Monday's headline where he was putting everything in this weird oil ETF. But OG, oh, I don't think that having a bias toward more volatility in a responsible way with the diversified index, to your point, it's not going to make a big difference either way. So why not? If, if, if he's comfortable with a more aggressive portfolio, I, I truly don't see the downside at this point to more toward small companies and less into large companies. The only problem is, is that you have to recognize what, what the other end of the stick is. Because if we know that small companies tend to do better than big companies over long periods of time, and you say, well, I'm just going to automatically take that. Yeah, I'll take that higher return. And that's fine, except you have to recognize what that comes with. It comes with every so often a minus 65. And so the only issue with going, I've got all the time in the universe and I'll just be super aggressive, is that super aggressive means you're going to have 100 grand and then in a year you'll have 35 and you're not going to change it ever. Because somewhere on that journey, most people between 100 and 35, going from 100,000, down to 35,000, somewhere in there go, yeah, I guess I screwed this up. I should have done something different. And then you erase all of that. I'm going to be aggressive part and, and blow it up at the worst time. So I'd much rather have the smoother ride. That is a little bit lower return 
than an all small cap portfolio, which statistically will give you a much higher return and compound it a ton more. But with that, you have to be okay with watching your million dollar portfolio turn into 30, 350,000 and then just go, yeah, just another day, just hang out, just let it ride and wait for that compounding to take effect again. And I just don't think that most people would do that. How was your day today? I lost $650,000. How are you? Yeah. I, I just don't think most people would have the um, stomach for that. Congratulations, Kevin, on the work you've done so far. And I hope that was helpful. I love the idea of uh, starting to think a little more critically about your asset allocation, but I'm also with OG. Right now is the time to pour as much money in as you can, man. Good stuff. Hey, if you've got a question for us, like Kevin does, uh, head to stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail. And we're sending Kevin a greatest money show on earth, Stacky Benjamin's Haven Life t-shirt that shows the, the circus that it can be here in mom's basement. Did you hear what a Doug fan he was? I think that between those lines was give Doug my shirt. Pretty sure. I, I, Pretty I'm not sure. sure I heard that. Did you hear that, OG? I, I'm not sure no, I heard. You, you have to be in touch with the subtext of what people are saying. Shouldn't read between any lines. Should just take it at face value. I think that's what mm. our job is. You start all of a sudden mm. thinking you know what people are thinking, and next thing you know, you're making big mistakes. Because remember, when you assume, Doug. You get a t-shirt? <laughs> not what mom says. She's got a different phrase. Oh. But, hey, that's going to do it for today. Let's look at the community calendar. First of all, thanks to everyone who left a review. One here that uh, mom's putting on the fridge, five stars from Mr. Harrell is his name, Mr. Harrell. Creative, knowledgeable, hilarious. You have thousands of sources to choose from to become knowledgeable about personal finance, investing, and success. Why not get it all from the same source? While still covering the basics at times, the host and guest take it to the next level without feeling like you're in an Econ 101 lecture hall. If you're ready to move beyond debt, bad, investing, good, SP is a solid choice. Sarcasm, seriousness, and stellar guests Make it fun to become financially literate instead of a chore. Wow. Thanks for that, Mr. Harrell. And mom is bragging about you to the bridge club. Also, thanks to those of you loving on our Super Bowl episodes between the top five ways to win a couple of weeks ago uh, to win your money championship. OG, you and I went through that and we got so many great, great emails about that show and about Friday show with marketing PR expert Jason Harris on our round table on Friday. It was humbling, the number of people that mentioned those two. And if you'd missed those, I think those are good ones to, to go back and really pick up some, some great skills, either on personal branding on Friday or on the specific money basics that you need to practice to get where you want to go. Coming up on the calendar tomorrow at noon, Robert Farrington's on our Fireside app and YouTube. 12,000 people, by the way, guys, following us on Fireside. Now, if you're one of those people, happy to be bringing you these special events if you are somebody who is using tech software, evaluating different tech softwares, ask all your questions to Robert Farrington from the College Investor. Every year they dive deep into them. And not only do they write a great piece on it, they also studied them in detail and can go in depth on the positives and negatives of what's good, bad, and ugly when it comes to your tax prep software. Then at 5 p.m., Andrea Warrock is going to join me on parenting and money. If you're a parent, you don't want to miss Andrea. She's both a consumer finance expert and appears often on the morning shows with helpful tips. She's a mom of two young children and talks about juggling good money advice and being a parent. So 5 p.m. Eastern over on Instagram, 2 p.m. Pacific. So big day tomorrow, guys. But if you're not here for Instagram lives, for YouTubes, you're concerned about the market, this uh, chatter, recession, no recession. <laughs> I was watching that on a video just the other day. So uh, what's uh, actually going on here with this thing? You're hearing something different all the time. Well, OG and his team have put together a free guide that shares eight moves to make in a down market. This guide will help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. So head over to stackybenjamins.com slash guide. That's stackybenjamins.com slash guide. And you'll get this helpful free guide from OG. All right. I think that's it. Doug, man, you got it from here. The question of the day is... What should we have learned today? Well, Joe first, take some advice from Raymond Baker. Looking for straightforward money? Keep it simple and you won't end up in an orange jumpsuit. Second, 
Can you make $39,000 a month working 30 minutes a day? Eh, probably not. But you can work on building your skill set to drastically improve your income. But the big lesson? Listen, Joe, I know you thought the sheep was a different dolly. Still against the law. Thanks to Raymond Baker for joining us today. You can find out more about his work at RaymondWBaker.com. You'll also find a link to his book, Invisible Trillions, on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. You can hire Paulette as your very own writing coach. With her program, Your Personal Editor, you get 10 sessions one-on-one with Paulette to add power to your words. More information at yourpersonaleditor.com. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I've been really excited guys about, uh, some of the stuff that I've been watching lately. And, uh, did you, did you watch national treasure, Doug? The first two, maybe. I think I only watched it for, was there a third one? There might've been a third one, but I feel like they've never stopped making them. <laughs> well, I, I know that the first one was super right. And the second one, I was like, okay, that's, that's pretty good. I don't remember anything about it other than this was campy, good fun. So liking that kind of stuff. And I really liked, I mean, one of my favorite movies this year was bullet train, which really surprised me because it's not my kind of movie. Like nothing about that movie looked interesting and Cheryl and autumn wanted to go see it. So we went and saw it. What a well-written tight action pack. Have you seen bullet train? No. And what's weird about that is when it came out, the first three or four reviews, I kept showing up in my feed like reviews from movie critics, and they couldn't have been more negative about that movie. Like worst movie ever made. Can't believe anybody funded this thing. They were so negative. And then all of a sudden people started watching it and it's the greatest movie ever. I I know. I have yet to meet a person I know that watched it. That wasn't like, I've had three people come up to me since the beginning of the year that, and I know exactly who they are. We're like, Hey, uh, you always talk about movies on your show. Have you seen bullet train? Cause I just watched bullet train. I'm like, yeah, I saw, I saw bullet train. It is, it is super. Well, anyway, once again, can't be fun. So imagine my surprise when I saw Disney plus was going to be doing a series about national treasure. So this is a clip of the newish Disney series, national treasure edge of history. 
This holds a clue to a treasure of utmost importance. I thought about destroying it a million times. Look at these symbols. In order to prevent it falling into the wrong hands. The daughters of the plume serpent were here. So we're talking like an honest to God treasure map. Yeah. <gasps> That necklace. It was my dad's. He died when I was a baby. What is it? That's the symbol on your necklace. I know. What if I told you everything you know about your dad is a lie? Well, it leads to an important Imagine just being a girl in her early to mid 20s who thinks that her parents are both dead. Her mom died of cancer a year ago. Always told her that her dad was a loser, reprobate, horrible person. And, uh, turns out her dad was an international treasure hunter. And, um, as that voice you heard saying, what if I told you everything you think you know about your dad is a lie ends up actually being true. The guy who's speaking, by the way, was the original FBI agent from the original show. He was the guy that was actually chasing Nicholas Cage the entire time. And now he's the guy who's launching this, this search for the new treasure that the daughter gets involved in. The only person besides him from the original show, the guy that played Riley, who was kind of like the comedic sidekick guy, he's in the show a little bit. Nicholas Cage isn't in it. The woman that was on the show, not in it. Was that Renee Russo who was in the original one? No idea. If only I had a way to look that up. If only I could look up and see who was in the original one. But it doesn't matter because the name that you will know from this show is Catherine Zeta-Jones. Catherine Zeta-Jones is also a treasure hunter. She's prominent in this. You see her over and over again throughout the, throughout the show. If you remember the old days of National Treasure where you take your brain, you put it on hold, and you just get this fantastic romp through history. In this case, it's Mayan and Incan and Aztec history. And you walk through it, but in a series that's eight episodes long, this has been a lot of fun. I'm on episode seven, and I have thoroughly enjoyed this ride. It is not smart TV. It, it, is, not, it is not at all something that's going to win any Mensa awards or, or isn't even going to win an Emmy. But man, just family fun on Disney+. Plus. I thought Disney Plus did a great job of this. Catherine Zeta-Jones is fantastic in it i've enjoyed it by the way the woman in the original is diane kruger and diane she, kruger yes yeah, she was in one of my favorite movies That's of right. all time in glorious bastards yes fantastic yeah national treasure edge of history doug is not going to go down as one of my favorites in history but for people that like um just a, a smart show that i think you can largely watch with your family i think you know kids over nine ten years old like it's perfect for Disney+. Plus. This is what you think of when you think of Disney+. Plus. National Treasure.